Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. My name is Evan Rudder. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement at the college. And uh, from myself, the Alumni and Parent Engagement team, the college, we hope you're uh, healthy, your families are doing well, uh, and we wish you the best during these um, very unusual and difficult times. Um, it's our pleasure to be doing now, I think, week, um, week seven or week eight of these virtual programs. Thrilled to have Professor Daniel Livesey with us uh, today. Uh, Professor Livesey actually did a talk for us um, uh, at the Pentagius, just outside the Pentagius Theater in Hollywood when Hamilton was here a couple of years ago. And he was actually scheduled to do it again. We had 70 tickets to Hamilton at the Pantages uh, end of April, and of course had to unfortunately cancel that. So we're thrilled to have Professor Livesey still with us um, and so willing and able to do a, a talk um, for our virtual community today. And I see we have people from all over the US, Pacific Northwest, Midwest, Northeast, and of course, all over the California and Southwest area uh, as well. Um, we uh, did actually graduate um, 334 members of the class of 2020 about a week and a half ago, uh, not in person. Uh, we have committed to doing an in-person graduation for them uh, at some point in the near future, whenever we can safely do it. Um, but we are doing everything we can to recognize them um, during these uh, difficult times. Um, if you haven't yet made your annual gift, our fiscal year is June 30. We do encourage you to make a gift to the Alumni Fund or the Parent Fund. You can also designate it to support the Class of 2020 or the Crisis Response Fund. So please consider doing, doing that. Um, little Zoom protocol at the bottom, you'll see a chat feature. If you click that chat button, the chat will pop up to your right. You see there are a lot of people who put in their name and class year and parent year and what uh, city state they're in. There's also a participants button. If you open up that participants button, you'll see the 80, you and 86 other people that are currently joining us. Uh, and there's also a raise hand feature. So when we do the question and answer session, if you click raise your hand, I will call on you to ask your question. If you put the question in the chat feature, then I will ask that question on your behalf uh, when it comes up um, as appropriate. So I'm doing a, a, whatever I can to moderate to, um, uh, the Q&A portion when we get there. Um, and feel free to always uh, direct chat me if you have any questions or, um, uh, or comments as well. Um, it's now my pleasure to bring uh, Professor Livesey to the, uh, the forefront of this lecture. He's a scholar of early American and Atlantic history. His work examines the intersection of race, family, and slavery in North America and the Caribbean. He teaches courses on slavery, Native American history, the history of the family, revolutions, and racial ideologies in the Americas. His recent book, Children of Uncertain Fortune, Mixed Race Jamaicans in Britain and the Atlantic Family, uh, from the years of 1733 to 1833, was published in January of 2018 by the University of North Carolina Press. And it's my pleasure to hand it over to Professor Livesey. Well, thanks so much, Evan, and uh, thank you all for joining me. I thought there would be like three people on this call, so I'm a little bit intimidated by all these numbers at the bottom here. Um, and it's great to see some former students. I see Adele and Jeremy and Brian, and it's really great that you all took some time out of your day to, to come and learn some history. Um, I've been trying to keep myself sane through like watching YouTube yoga videos and workout videos and, and these kind of YouTube uh, uh, workout stars, I always say, Congratulate yourselves on taking the time out of your day to engage in your practice. I'm gonna congratulate all of you on taking time out of your day to learn some history. Um, and also you're getting a little bit of a taste of what classes were like uh, this past spring. So some of you probably use Zoom a lot, but um, for those of you that don't, this is kind of what a typical class would look like. So you kind of get a taste of what our students are going through. Um, so I think you all probably read the description of the, of the talk. Um, so I just wanna kind of go into the scope of what I'm gonna be discussing today and then we'll just get right into the thick of it. Um, we're all kind of learning obviously what a pandemic is like. And for most of us, we haven't lived through a pandemic. And so um, there's a lot that we're still kind of getting used to. Um, but the thing is that you probably all have got a sense of this at this point, that pandemics have really been a part of human history for all of human history. And this is sort of something that everyone uh, in the past has had to go through to some extent. And humans for a long time have kind of had to put themselves into self quarantine as well. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the Decameron, which is a real classic of Italian literature. And that's, that story is really about a bunch of people who are kind of quarantining themselves against the plague uh, in the medieval period and telling each other stories. And that's, that's sort of what the Decameron is. So disease is obviously such a central part of human history, uh, but beyond even just the aspects of sort of death and the, the population loss that comes from that, um, disease was really critical for all sorts of things, particularly in the sort of political and cultural sphere for societies that had to endure them. 
And this is especially true in the history of the Americas um, because we have these, these two different hemispheric places. We have the old world of Europe and Africa and Asia and the new world of North and South America and the Caribbean. And these two locations have been separated for thousands and thousands of years and developed very different populations. Uh, when they suddenly came crashing into one another in 1492, uh, there was a tremendous amount the disease had to do with the recurrent history that came after that. Um, we call this uh, the Columbian Exchange, which is the movement of flora and fauna and microbes across um, the Atlantic Ocean and, and from the old world to the new world. Um, and it created a sort of a truly global society. And what I want to argue today is that disease uh, was perhaps one of the most critical factors in the political and cultural development um, of the Americas after 1492. And I want to do that by looking at two different diseases. Uh, the first is smallpox and the second is malaria. So I want to start with a quick quote um, from a Mexica. They're sometimes called the Aztec people who had to deal with uh, the advent of smallpox uh, in 1519 when the Spanish came in and invaded the city state of Tenochtitlan, which was the capital of the Mexica Empire. Um, and this comes from a transcription from a Spanish friar who had interviewed a number of Mexica people about what that experience was like. And so this is a, a slightly long quote. So if you don't mind indulging me, I just want to read uh, what the Mexica reported about what their experience of smallpox was like. Uh, this person said, quote, before the Spaniards had risen against us, first there came to be a prevalent, a great sickness, a plague. Pustules spread everywhere, on one's face, on one's head, on one's breast. There was indeed perishing. Many indeed died of it. No longer could they walk. They only lay in their abodes, in their beds. No longer could they move. No longer could they bestir themselves. No longer could they raise themselves. No longer could they stretch themselves out face down. No longer could they stretch themselves out on their backs. And when they bestirred themselves, much did they cry out. There was much perishing, like a covering were the pustules. Indeed, many people died of them, and many just died of hunger. There was death from hunger, and there was no one to take care of one another. There was no one to attend one another. And we can see in this quote, sort of both the personal and the community devastation uh, of smallpox. And we can, I think, recognize some features of what we're going through today with the COVID pandemic, which is that the, the disease not only kind of uh, infected people's bodies and caused death and devastation, uh, but it also had a lot of wider effects too. And for the Mexica, uh, as for many other new world societies, it wasn't just the death and the sickness itself, which was so destructive, but it was also the obliteration of the economy and the politics and the basic method of living for people in those communities that were affected by it. So let's get into the, sort of the details of smallpox and then I'll sort of talk about what its, its long-term effects were. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share just a few little slides which will give you a sense about this uh, and what it was. So this is the virus, uh, variola major, uh, which is the virus that causes smallpox. Um, and smallpox is sort of similar to COVID in certain ways and that um, estimates are that it originally spread from an, from an animal uh, in the old world, possibly from Africa. Um, and the best estimates are that it either came from a camel or a rodent and it spread to humans about 15,000 years ago. And the symptoms were pretty horrific. The most telltale signs were blisters or pustules that developed on one's face and one's body. And usually those smallpox scars would stay for life. And it was sort of uh, evidence that a person had gone through that disease. Um, but there were also a lot of other horrific aspects to this illness, uh, vomiting, high fever, severe pain, uh, mouth and nose sores, anxiety. That was sort of registered that people became very anxious as you could imagine when they got this disease, but it sort of went almost into a neurological issue. Um, and also potential blindness. And of the people that were affected by it, um, usually children, women who were pregnant and the elderly were the most affected by it. Um, one of the things of the advantages about smallpox is that once you had recovered from it, you were immune for life. Um, and that was really critical for what would happen in, uh, in sort of subsequent aspects of people's lives and histories. Um, not only that, but antibodies could actually be passed down to babies through their mother's breast milk if their mothers had survived smallpox as well. So in the old world, there had been kind of a recurrence, a constant recurrence of smallpox, in particular because in Europe, uh, populations were much more densely settled than other areas. And so smallpox was just a sort of everyday part of people's lives. Many children died from it, many recovered from it. Some, as I mentioned, had some resistance because of their mothers, um, but there was a strong level of immunity amongst European adults. Among the New World, though, there was no immunity at all to this. And moreover, some genetic studies have postulated that indigenous Americans had less immune uh, diversity than Europeans did. So that would create kind of the conditions 
for a horrific pandemic once the Europeans came to the New World in 1492. Now, it's sort of difficult to track when those diseases arrived because we have to really depend upon the way that people described the, the course of illness and what they saw amongst people who were getting sick. Um, smallpox is especially tricky because of the course of its infection. Now, I hope you can read this next slide. If not, I apologize. Um, this gives you some sense about sort of the course of the disease. So you'll see for the first two weeks, uh, individuals aren't really contagious, and that's followed by two weeks of, of very contagiousness uh, amongst populations. Um, now, this is interesting because it actually perhaps uh, limits the possibility that smallpox came very early to the New World. Um, because of the length of time it takes to sail from Europe to the Americas, most likely it took about 20 to 30 years before smallpox finally made it to the New World, simply because if someone was uh, infected with smallpox when they boarded a ship, they would have recovered by the time they got to the New World, so they couldn't have spread it. Um, but we do know that by 1518, there's enough evidence uh, in the reports about the Caribbean that smallpox had entered into the Caribbean by that time period. Um, now, the case fatality rates for this really varied. And if we look at Europe, uh, the estimates are that um, uh, in the medieval period, smallpox fatality rates were about 7% of the population. Uh, in the United States in the 18th century, people estimate that about 15 to 30% of people that got smallpox died from it. Now, this is pretty severe. If we think about COVID right now, uh, less than 1% of the population that gets it um, dies from it. So this is 15 to 30 times that for COVID. Um, there was an outbreak in India in the early 20th century in which 43% of the population died from smallpox. That's pretty extreme. But some estimates are that for the indigenous populations in the Americas, because there was this lack of immune diversity, that somewhere between 40 to 50% of the people that got smallpox ended up dying from it, and that the infection rate was about 80%. So some estimates are that in certain areas that were especially hard hit by smallpox in the New World, uh, that within a generation, about 25 to 30 years, about 90% of that population died off. So we get these pretty horrific images that come um, from, from these early infections. So this is uh, um, from the Florentine Codex. This is a, a document that was made by the Spanish um, after they invaded Mexico. And these come from uh, indigenous uh, artists who were trying to depict what the smallpox epidemic looked like. And so this is an image of one individual uh, with sort of telltale pustules and marks on their skin. Um, this is another one that I show my students oftentimes of a person caring for a sick uh, individual. And people often think that these little things coming out of their mouths is a sign that they recognize that it came through the air. Um, these are really actually speech bubbles, if you look at the way that the Mexica actually does to depict their, um, their images. But you can see the ways in which it obviously had a huge impact on indigenous peoples that were affected by it. Um, now, the estimates for the total effect of this are, are kind of hard to come by. There are some estimates that um, both North and South America had as many as 100 million people uh, in 1492. Um, so you might have read the book 1491, which goes into some of the, the details about this. Um, it's thought that within a century, about 80% of that population had been reduced, so that perhaps 80 million people died in the century after the arrival of Columbus. Um, smallpox was not the only reason for that. There were a number of other diseases as well, influenza, diphtheria, measles, typhus, mumps, um, on top of that warfare and other aspects. Um, but it had a huge toll on those populations. So let's just talk about what the actual history on the ground was for those individuals that had to go through it. Oh, oops, and I'm gonna just stop sharing for a second so you don't have to look at that too long. Um, well, it seems almost impossible to imagine new world colonization without the influence of disease. Um, it was absolutely critical, especially for the Spanish to be able to conquer Mexico um, because of smallpox. And the person who was most responsible for this was Hernan Cortez, um, who invaded uh, Mexico in 1519. Um, Cortez's first major victory, which would kind of set the pace for the conquest of Central America, was on the city-state of Tenochtitlan, which was the capital of the Mexica Empire. Um, and Cortez had visited the city before he actually laid siege to it. There had been kind of a diplomatic mission into Tenochtitlan. And it's most likely that in that mission, that smallpox was spread into the city. Um, Cortez returned several weeks later uh, with thousands of indigenous allies who were helping him to put down uh, the Mexica. And by that point, the city had been kind of overrun with smallpox. It had killed a large number of people in the city. 
Um, but as I showed in my opening quote, beyond just the sort of the death that occurred from that, um, it also weakened many others and it destroyed their ability to kind of feed themselves. It basically ravaged the economy. And so the city was in terrible shape uh, once Cortez went into, into the city. Um, many of you have probably read Jared Diamond's uh, Gun, Germs and Steel, which kind of goes into this issue a little bit. And you know how critical it was that disease um, came into new world populations in order to facilitate uh, settlement. And it certainly helps to explain why 400 Spaniards were able to um, conquer a city of a quarter of a million people in Mexico. So the initial waves of European colonization were absolutely critical uh, to their ability to subdue indigenous populations and to begin colonial settlement. Um, as we saw, it weakened people through death and disease, um, but it also upended political stability in those regions too, as hierarchies fell apart, um, as populations struggled to kind of recoup and to reorganize themselves, and it made it much easier for Europeans uh, to begin their process of settlement. But I think there's some caution that we have to take when thinking too much about the effects of disease, especially because um, we don't want to just see it as disease kind of did what it did and there was nothing that could be done about that. This is what's called the sort of virgin soil theory of epidemic disease in the history of the Americas. Um, and that story basically goes that, that, you know, these were populations that didn't have immunity to smallpox and other diseases. And so it was almost a kind of an inevitability that they were going to be uh, decimated by those once Europeans arrived and once these kind of old world and new worlds came into contact with one another. Um, and that sort of papers over a much more complex history about what happened after 1492. Um, and it also papers over the ways in which Europeans exacerbated the disease um, by their actions in the decades that followed 1492. It also eliminates the agency of Native Americans to how they dealt with the disease itself. And Native Americans were not passive in trying to deal with uh, smallpox and other diseases. They actually worked very aggressively to try to protect themselves. Um, even though there was no understanding of sort of the germ theory of disease, Native Americans, like many others, understood very quickly uh, that human interaction helped to spread smallpox. And so very quickly, they tried to do what they could to self-quarantine. Um, so there's a really great example of this, which didn't take place uh, during Mexican colonization, but actually took place a couple of hundred years later. And that, had a, uh, that occurred during the period of the American Revolution. Now, there was a massive smallpox epidemic during the American Revolution. And this was in part because anytime there was a sort of global war conflict, disease would spread rapidly. Um, some of you have probably been reading a lot about the sort of uh, 1918 flu pandemic. And one of the accelerators for that pandemic was World War I and the sort of um, uh, conglomeration uh, of people in certain areas that sort of allowed for disease to spread much more rapidly. And that happened during the American Revolution as well. And it spread, smallpox spread all throughout North and South America because of that conflict. And one of the native nations that was most successful in combating, combating that were the Comanche, who uh, sort of their main epicenter of territory is modern day Texas. And the Comanche had a sort of empire in Texas in the 18th century. And they were very adamant about putting roadblocks all throughout the corners of their empire to ensure that people weren't coming into their territory because they understood that smallpox would, be, would spread if they allowed people to come in and out. And they were actually quite successful at reducing the amount of infection in their nation because of it. Um, there are a number of other examples of the Native Americans who were also quite good at trying to isolate themselves to prevent the spread of that disease. But it made it very difficult in the face of what the Europeans were doing in their settlements in the New World. And uh, there were a number of things that Europeans did that kind of exacerbated the spread of smallpox. And one of the worst of these was their practice of slave trading. Um, so the Spanish in particular were quite aggressive in enslaving indigenous Americans uh, for use, particularly in mining operations. Now, this seems kind of strange, I think, for a lot of us who, when we think about slavery, at least in the US, we think about African slavery, and that's kind of the foremost image in our heads that um, American slavery was African in origin. But in fact, for the first 150 years after uh, 1492, the majority of enslaved people in the Americas were indigenous, and the African slavery was built on top of indigenous slavery. Um, and so that enslavement of indigenous people actually really exacerbated the spread of smallpox for a couple of reasons. Um, first, in the capture and the sale and the transfer of indigenous people to locations where they're going to work, um, that helped to create long distance trade networks, which in turn created long distance avenues for the disease to spread. And so we see that smallpox actually went much further into the interior of parts of the Americas because 
of the extensiveness of these slave trade networks, which were breaking indigenous people into gold and silver mines in Mexico and Peru. Uh, these were jobs that the Spanish simply would not do for themselves because they were horrifically dangerous jobs. The average lifespan of a mine worker in one of these mines was about three months. Um, so the Spanish were, were using indigenous peoples against their will to do this. On top of this, these mining centers, because they were so lucrative and they were making so much money for the Spanish, uh, they were bringing thousands and thousands of people into these mining centers to support that business. And the concentration of those people into those centers allowed for smallpox to spread even more rapidly than it would have otherwise. So again, the, the notion that kind of disease could kind of spread uncontrollably wasn't really true. Um, if left to their own devices, Native Americans would have likely have uh, prevented the spread of, of smallpox to the extent that it did. Um, but some of the aspects of colonization really exacerbated how that disease uh, was going to spread. And it, in fact, it had spread quite widely. Um, the geographic spread of smallpox in the first hundred years after colonization were pretty remarkable. Um, virtually every society in North and South America was touched by it by 1600. And so when we think about uh, the English arriving in Jamestown in 1607 or in Plymouth Rock in 1620, uh, they were encountering indigenous populations that had already been touched by smallpox and had already been kind of transformed by its effects. So many of those uh, indigenous communities in the East Coast of the United States had really been, uh, their, their political networks had been upended by disease um, and then they were much more vulnerable to um, colonization because they didn't have the same political and demographic strength as they had beforehand. So smallpox was helpful, not just in terms of how the Spanish were settling in the Americas, but also how the, the English and the French and others were settling in those locations. Now, one final thing about smallpox before I move on to malaria, which is that it wasn't just that we have this kind of initial wave of colonization, which enabled um, smallpox to, to really ravage the indigenous populations. Um, smallpox still had an important role for centuries after 1492. And uh, one of the, the sort of best examples to kind of go back to it is the American Revolution. Um, and it was particularly critical for that conflict. One of the people who was most affected by smallpox who had the most kind of memory of it was George Washington. Um, George Washington uh, went with his brother to Barbados uh, when he was 19 years old and Washington contracted smallpox on that trip and he had a particularly uh, heinous bout of it and had smallpox scars which he was always sort of embarrassed about for the rest of his life. Um, but this had a pretty uh, strong impact on the way that he viewed disease and the way that he viewed his responsibilities as a general going forward. Um, in fact, he was quite adamant when the war started that his soldiers needed to be inoculated against smallpox. Um, inoculation at that time was a pretty controversial practice because it was seen as being um, sort of a, a kind of a malevolent science and it was seen as kind of plain God. And it was also just seen sort of like being a creepy thing because inoculation is you take the scabs of someone who's infected with smallpox and you inject it into somebody else's arm. Um, and for reasons that we're still not quite sure why this is, um, it produces a weakened version of the disease, uh, which is far less fatal and uh, allows people to, to achieve that immunity, which is so desirable. So Washington was pretty adamant about inoculating his soldiers, which was really critical because he was fighting against a British army that came from the old world. And if you remember, the old world populations had much greater immunity to smallpox. And so just to kind of even the field a little bit in terms of that disease difference, uh, it was really critical that Washington inoculated his army. On the flip side, the British had a little bit of a challenge with smallpox um, in the second half of the war. So uh, if I can just kind of talk very briefly about the, the second half of the American Revolution. Um, the first half was really fought in the northern colonies and the second half was fought in the southern colonies. And the British were initially quite dependent in that southern theater of the war on enslaved individuals. Um, in 1775, the British offered freedom to any enslaved person that ran away from their masters and joined the British army to fight. And so thousands and thousands of enslaved Americans actually ran away to join the British. Now, these were populations that had lived in pretty rural areas. They were on plantations where smallpox was not prevalent. So many of them had not had any experience with smallpox and no exposure to it. And they also had not been inoculated. Um, planters did not see that it was appropriate to inoculate their enslaved workers. So the British were depending upon some 10,000 enslaved combatants who were fighting against the American patriots. And those populations initially did pretty well in helping the British in the Southern theater, but they very quickly succumbed to smallpox 
and it really damaged the British ability to kind of fight the Americans in that second half of the American Revolution. So that Southern campaign, um, the, the American patriots were helped quite a bit by the fact that enslaved individuals that were fighting for the British were hurt pretty badly by smallpox. And I'll come back to the American Revolution in just a minute to talk about the other aspects of disease uh, that were critical for that. So just to some of the, the smallpox aspect before I jump into malaria, um, it really was critical to the history of the Americas long after that initial wave of colonization in 1492. And because most of the Americas were never as densely populated as Europe, smallpox immunity never developed and pandemics would regularly occur throughout the Americas. Um, because warfare threw so many people together uh, into the same place at the same time, um, it always made things worse. And so uh, it wasn't just that bullets were important in these wars, it was also that microbes were quite important as well. So let's jump into to one final disease and then I'll, I'll start to wrap things up and we can kind of take questions about this. Uh, and that is uh, malaria. And malaria was also quite critical to the course of, um, of warfare in the new world in lots and lots of different ways. But it has very different components to it than say smallpox. So let me just uh, return back to my slide really quickly and we can talk about that. So this is uh, the virus that causes malaria. It's quite a pretty slide with nice purple colors, but it's a quite horrific illness. Uh, malarial symptoms were somewhat similar, but also quite different from smallpox. Um, usually there was a high fever. There were kind of circular patterns of having the sweats and then the chills. Um, the only really visible sign that someone had malaria was that they would be jaundiced because malaria would oftentimes attack the liver. And there were also just a lot of general pains and malaise in the body. Um, the way that uh, uh, malaria would kind of cause death is it would typically attack organs. And so organ failure was the most uh, common cause of death for those that were infected by it. And of the populations that were um, hit by malaria, children were usually the ones who fared the worst. Small, or excuse me, malaria is actually quite different from smallpox in a number of ways. And I wanna talk about that really quickly before we get into um, some of the, the similarities to how malaria affected military developments and political developments. So I wanna highlight three particular differences between those two diseases. Um, the first is the aspect of immunity. So malaria doesn't actually confer full immunity after someone has recovered from it. Um, it does uh, uh, confer slight improvements in the ability to fight uh, uh, recurrent bouts of malaria, um, but it doesn't give full immunity. But that means that after a couple of bouts of malaria, um, by and large, subsequent infections did not cause fatalities. So one could build up um, sort of a preferential immunity over time. And this is what was, this created what was called differential immunity. And the idea of differential immunity is that people that lived in different environments had different immunities. So those who had spent a large number of time in the tropics um, where malaria was most common um, had much more kind of protections against malaria than those who came from other places, particularly um, from Europe. So that's the sort of the first major difference between malaria and smallpox. The second is that malaria is not transmitted through the air. It's transmitted through what's called a vector. And in this case, the vector is this little guy, uh, the mosquito. Now the mosquito, as you all know, feeds on blood from humans and in repeated feedings, it transmits malaria from one person to the next. And in the tropics, it also transmits it from certain mammals to humans as well. So it's not just, it can actually go into monkeys and, and, and increase the spread as well. Now the mosquito is an African animal and malaria is an African disease. And in all likelihood, malaria and the mosquito both came from an African slave ship brought to the New World. Now, West Africans actually had some protections against malaria because it was endemic in their societies, and West Africans were the individuals who were most ravaged by the slave trade. Um, there was some small genetic protections that some individuals had uh, through the so-called sickle cell trait, and sickle cell basically kind of um, uh, uh, creates a kind of trait in the hemoglobin which prevents the spread of malaria once a person has been infected with it. Um, and there was another sort of genetic trait that certain populations in both the extreme north and the extreme south of Africa had, uh, which actually gave full immunity to, to malaria. So there were some protections that Africans had um, against malaria when they came to the new world. Um, and sort of because of this added resistance, um, sadly, uh, uh, the immunity that some Africans had actually gave some support 
to justifying the slave trade. Um, because uh, observers tended to notice that Africans died less often from malaria, uh, that became used as a defense as to why African slavery should continue uh, with this notion that, well, only African populations um, are, the, the, it's only the African populations who can work in these hot climates and can survive malaria. Therefore, we should still continue to use them for plantations in the Caribbean and uh, the, the sort of tropical regions. Um, the third thing that's kind of different or, or maybe has a different component to it about malaria compared to, to smallpox is the ways in which humans could actually exacerbate even just the spread of that contagion. So one of the things that's most important for malaria to thrive is for mosquitoes to thrive. And mosquitoes thri thrive when there's a lot of water. And so humans create conditions in which there's a lot more standing water. One of which is just there's a lot of cisterns that people set up in order to kind of allow themselves to collect water. Uh, those cisterns create ideal breeding grounds for mosquitoes. A second way is that um, plantations in the Caribbean and the southern parts of the United States uh, required clear cutting of forests. And when forests were clear cut, uh, the soil would oftentimes wash away. It would create much more um, uh, swampy environments. And those swamps created more breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So plantations in, themselves actually created better breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And then finally, mosquitoes also feed on sugar. That's one of the things that they, beyond just mammals, they, they also feed on sugar. And uh, the most dominant crop in the tropics in the 17th and the 18th centuries was sugarcane. And so um, that aspect of colonization was also critical for the spread of mosquitoes. So all these things made uh, uh, malaria a rampant, terrible problem um, for everyone, from Europeans to indigenous Americans uh, to Africans in the New World. Uh, and once again, um, colonial settlement exacerbated those conditions. Now, malaria was initially kind of completely unknown uh, about sort of how it was spread until kind of the end of the 19th century. And that's when people started to understand what um, actually was happening. In fact, the term malaria means bad air. There was a belief that it just had to do with kind of bad air in a, in a climate, and that's why malaria spread. Um, but there were two things that people in the early modern period noticed about malaria which were really critical to its development. The first is that they recognized that people suffered less under repeated bouts and that people who had been in a, a kind of tropical climate tended to do better than other individuals. So that was the first observation that they had. The second is that they recognized um, that malarial infection increased significantly after heavy bouts of rain. Um, they didn't understand why that was, but they just understood that um, once they, once kind of heavy rains hit, that they would uh, have a, a big malarial infections afterwards. So understanding those two key concepts was really critical for what happened um, in the defenses of New World territories. So let me get into that aspect. So here we're going to get back into the military issue for just a second. So there were three main empires in the New World. There was the Spanish Empire, there was the British Empire, and there was the French Empire. And these three empires were in constant warfare with one another to try to wrest colonial plantations from one another. These were incredibly lucrative spots. For the Spanish, their colonies had a lot of gold and silver uh, wealth. For the British and the French, their colonies had a lot of agricultural wealth with um, sugar in particular being the most dominant crop. So because of this, these empires were at war with one another constantly in the 17th and the 18th centuries, trying to improve their finances. But it was very hard for an invading European army to ever conquer a local colonial territory. And the reason for that was because of malaria and the protections that those local areas had. So let me give you an example of this to kind of make you understand how this works. So in 1740, the British tried to um, uh, attack and take the city of Cartagena, which is in modern day Colombia. And they were trying to take it from the Spanish in the hopes of getting into the sort of Spanish uh, silver mining, uh, uh, not too far away. So the British army came over and it was entirely British people who had no immunity to malaria whatsoever. And they faced a local population that had either been born there or had spent many, many years there and had a fair amount of immunity uh, to malaria. So the local army knew that if they could just kind of hold on for about two weeks, that the British army would become infected with malaria and they would have to kind of give up. And so in fact, that's what happened when the British arrived they sort of fought for a few days against the British, and they actually abandoned their forts, uh, knowing that once the British kind of came in, they would become sick pretty quickly. And in fact, that's what happened. Within 10 days, uh, the British started to succumb to malaria, 
Um, and uh, four days after that, they basically decide to abandon the whole operation because at least half of their fighting force was kind of decimated by um, malarial infection. So for European armies, it was very, very hard to take co um, uh, colonial possessions, especially those in the Caribbean, because malarial infection just made it very hard for uh, European troops to ever succeed in those areas. But there were long-term consequences to this as well. Um, in fact, it was critical to independence movements in uh, the Americas, even the, the US independence movement. But most importantly, it was uh, important to the Latin American independence movements. Um, so in the early 19th century, uh, from 1808 to 1833, there was a 25 year period when all but two of Spain's American uh, colonies rebelled successfully against the Spanish empire. Uh, the only two were Cuba and Puerto Rico. They stayed loyal to the Spanish, but all the rest uh, uh, fought for their independence from the Spanish. And many have argued the only way that they were able to do that was because they had this deferential immunity to malaria. So whenever an independence movement would rise up, the Spanish would send uh, armies from Europe, they would come in, and within a couple of weeks, they would be so sick with malaria that they would be unable to put down these resistance movements. Now, there's lots of other issues that go into this as well. It's not just so simple as disease, but disease was absolutely critical to prevent uh, those European empires from keeping independence movements from rising up in their colonial territories. And this was true of the American Revolution too. So if we can go back to that just for a second, and, and I'm, I'm just about finished up here, so don't mean to talk your ear off about all this. Um, but if you remember, the, the second half of the American independence movement uh, took place in the South, at least the, the military portion of the revolution. So the British Army was dependent upon ships coming from overseas to resupply them. So because of that, they had to constantly hang around the coast because that was the only way that they could be resupplied um, in that period. So those coastal areas were the biggest breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And so because of that, malaria was a huge problem for the British in the South. And the British particularly were using troops from Scotland and from England, and they were also hiring mercenaries from Germany who had very little protections against malaria. America's troops were much better off. There was not full immunity, uh, of course, but a lot of the American uh, uh, patriots uh, uh, came from the south and so they had some uh, differential immunity uh, to malaria and they were joined by French troops who would not come from France but actually come from a long tour of duty in the Caribbean and so had therefore been what they call seasoned against malaria and had some differential immunity to that disease. So when the final battle of the American Revolution took place um, at Yorktown which is a sort of a swampy uh, area in Virginia, uh, the British very very quickly started to succumb rapidly uh, to malaria, while the American and French forces, which had not full immunity, but better immunity to that disease, ended up faring much better. Um, about 40% of Britain's um, troops were either dead or sick or in really bad shape from this outbreak of malaria at Yorktown. And so their, their commanding soldier, uh, Lord Cornwallis, surrendered to George Washington in part when he realized that he couldn't survive this bout of malaria and he couldn't survive uh, the siege. So malaria both solidified uh, colonial possessions against rival attacks for Europeans, and it also ensured that once those colonies were ready to fight for their independence, the Europeans couldn't hold on to them. And all this is really just to show that disease has been a constant in human history. It's always been amongst us. It seems kind of new to us right now, but it's been a major player in so many events in the past. Uh, it obviously, it changes individuals' lives, it devastates families, it destroys communities, uh, but it also transforms how the military and political history of those areas has progressed. And in many ways, it has made the modern world what it is today. So let me just put up this slide, which um, here's a couple of books if you're interested, kind of go into these two issues, both about smallpox and malaria. And uh, uh, if, if you're interested, those, those two books have a lot more about them. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Great, <laughs> thank you, Professor Livesey. Uh, we now turn it over to the Q&A portion and Art Dodd, you are the first to raise your hand. So go ahead and unmute and ask away. Well, Dan, thank you very much. If we go back to May 1980 and May 18, my graduation day, we thought Mount St. Helens vaporizing the cubic mile of earth was quite an event, small potatoes compared to a pandemic. But I wanted to ask about the tension being a zero-sum game at times and having an opportunity cost. And you said the 
Comanche setting up roadblocks and the manpower that required. What perhaps do we have at risk if we ignore things like measles now and other things of that nature with a focus on a COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, in full disclosure, I, I'm not a historian of disease. And so um, those are probably questions I could only answer as somewhat as an amateur. Um, the thing about being an early American historian is you sort of have to know about disease because it's so central. Um, but obviously, I think what we're, we're facing here is, is um, a kind of a wake-up call for how important it is to recognize the paths of disease and that we can't sort of ignore the recurrence of certain diseases. And these things don't necessarily fully go away. And if we kind of go back to what I was talking about with smallpox, it wasn't as if, okay, there's a few initial waves and it's over. It was a constant problem really until the middle of the 20th century. So I'm really probably not an expert enough to answer that question in terms of the modern uh, day. I think that's absolutely a critical one to ask. And I think that it's really incumbent upon us to kind of keep attention on those diseases. All right, next we have Pete Wells. Pete from Oregon, if you wanna ask your question. The era of um, the middle of the 1800s, um, the smallpox and other diseases affected heavily the Native American population and permitted the growth into of uh, the Europeans into the indigenous populations in um, the Midwest and West Coast uh, is was most of that smallpox, or is are there other diseases that were involved in that transition? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I kind of isolated smallpox as being the one that that often I, I think gets a lot of the attention because it was such a damaging disease. Um, but no, I, what, there were plenty of other old world diseases uh, which went into that. Um, so. You know, we think about uh, diphtheria and uh, cholera and measles, uh, all of those had huge impacts on those populations as well. So smallpox was one of a battery of different illnesses which uh, came into the new world and which indigenous populations just had no immunity to. Um, syphilis was an, a new world disease which made its way back to the old world. So that kind of went in the reverse direction. But for the most part, um, yeah, there was uh, numerous diseases which had multiple effects on indigenous populations. But smallpox was particularly virulent. It spread very easily, and it also had a very, very high mortality rate compared to some of those other diseases. But you're absolutely right. There were um, uh, a number of other diseases which are important too. All right, we're going to a question uh, from Jay in Chicago. How would you compare and contrast yellow fever as a factor during the colonial period? That's a great question. So uh, yellow fever is uh, the, the sort of twin to malaria in this tropical, in the tropical regions. So um, yellow fever is distinct from uh, malaria and that it does confer full immunity once you've had it. So it operates a little bit like smallpox, um, but it had the exact same effect, which is that for those European armies that came into um, the Caribbean especially, uh, they really struggled against um, local armies because of the, the twin effects of yellow fever and malaria. And this is something I always have to tell my students. They always wonder why I talk so much about the Caribbean. They're just like, oh, I think of the Caribbean as a place where I go on vacation, and why is it such a big deal? Well, the Caribbean was the most lucrative spot in the world in the 18th century, and um, the most profitable colony in the British Empire uh, in 1776 was not Virginia, it wasn't North, uh, New York, it wasn't South Carolina, it was Jamaica, um, a tiny island about the size of Connecticut. And so the Caribbean was especially important for European empires because that was where so much money was being made on the backs of enslaved people uh, to farm sugar, when sugar was the dominant cash crop of the 18th century world. So, um, so yeah, yellow fever is, is another fantastic example of this importance of differential immunity. And it does have slightly different characteristics to, to malaria, but, but also quite important. Next question from Ned. Um, what is the status of malaria in the US and the Americas today? 
So there's a lot of great treatment that they have for malaria. And um, so it, it, malaria is, is a little bit less of a problem than it had been, uh, but it's still devastating. I think um, 10 years ago, if I remember my, my data correctly, um, 400,000 people died from malarial complications in the world. So it's still, a, it's a still a horrible killer in many parts of the world, usually in places where people don't have the same access to healthcare. Um, there are some treatments, there were some treatments, I should say, that were developed in that period um, uh, prior to, to kind of the um, discovery of sort of vaccines and other aspects for, for malaria. Um, one of the things is uh, quinine. So you probably, if you have a gin and tonic, the gin and tonic came about because the British wanted some protection against malaria in India. And so tonic water, there, there is some protections that tonic offers um, for malarial infection. And so whenever you're drinking a gin and tonic, just know that you're drinking kind of um, an elixir that was, that was trying to kind of keep the, the British Army in good health. Um, so yeah, malaria is still a major problem. And if you travel in tropical areas, um, usually it's best to try to, to see if there's an outbreak in, in, in those regions. Next question. So Art Dodd put in, Art, you put in uh, tuberculosis, TB, tuberculosis uh, in the ease of spread. So uh, Professor Livesey, can you maybe comment, kind of like what you, what you do with the yellow fever, talk about TB and the ease of spread and how that impacted um, the Americas? That's a great question, and I don't think I'll be able to answer it with any kind of um, intelligence, to be totally honest. Uh, TB obviously was, was pretty critical. Um, it, it's just another disease that uh, uh, affected lots of people. It was um, not well understood at all, really, until the 20th century. I grew up in Colorado, which is a place where many people retreated to uh, in the hopes of kind of recuperating from tuberculosis. Um, but I think its its course of infection is less well understood in early American history, just because um, studying disease in the early modern period is just hard in general, because we have to just depend upon the way people reported their symptoms and the characteristics that they observed. And so it's very hard to kind of distinguish between uh, all these different diseases because they sometimes get kind of lumped together in part because there's a lot of similarities and symptoms. So um, as far as I know, there hasn't been a lot of great studies that have systematically explained how tuberculosis affected uh, the Americas because I think its symptoms are just a little bit more ambiguous or at least get lumped into other diseases as well. So I'm sorry I can't provide a better answer about that. Cynthia in Claremont. Um asks, how did people ascribe blame for diseases? Uh, for example, Indians recognize the risk of the British. Yeah, that's a great question. So there is a very simple recognition that this is transmittable uh, across people. And uh, there's a very famous case, which some of you probably know about, uh, which takes place during Pontiac's Rebellion. Pontiac's Rebellion was in 1763, and this was an outgrowth of the end of the French and Indian War. And it was, it was an indigenous uprising against the British after, their, uh, after they successfully defeated the French in that conflict. And um, very famously, Sir Jeffrey Amherst um, kind of openly uh, uh, appealed for uh, blankets that had been infected by smallpox or had been used to treat people who had had smallpox. And he was trying to uh, get those um, sent to uh, indigenous encampments to try to spread that disease. So it's kind of a case of biological warfare. And there's many examples of this happening in other places. And so there was a recognition certainly that humans could transmit this. Um, but of course there was all sorts of concerns and, and misunderstandings about what was going on too. And, and there were certain indigenous societies that didn't understand what was happening as, as many people, many Europeans didn't understand what was happening either. And unfortunately one of the consequences for indigenous societies at least in those early years of trying to deal with smallpox and not knowing what it was, was they were trying to use traditional forms of healing to deal with, um, with those diseases. And one of the traditional forms of healing, especially for native communities in North America was the use of the sweat lodge as a kind of a ri religious ritual to try to purify one in case of illness. And in fact, extreme heat um, is actually worse in the case of smallpox infection. So there's some evidence that the sweat lodge actually made things worse for many indigenous communities that were trying to, to fight against that illness. So yeah, absolutely, there, there was a lot of misunderstanding. There was, of course, a lot of um, ascribing these diseases to divine intervention, to godly punishment or, or godly reward. Um, so it, it really, there was a tremendous amount of confusion, um, although, it, 
lots and lots of evidence of both indigenous and European societies understanding very fully that there was a kind of a, a, a human to human transmission, at least in the case of smallpox. Thank you. Uh, Brian Davidson asks, are there any examples of cultural changes or adaptations in indigenous or colonial populations that can be attributed to the impact of disease? You mentioned gin and tonic as a good example. One of my favorite examples. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. I think we, we all should celebrate <laughs> with that. Um, yeah, in terms of cultural change, um, uh, that's a good question. Um, and I'll have to think about that more. I happen to see Brian from time to time, and so I might be able to give him an answer later on. Um, I, I think what the, the, the most simple answer is just sort of the transformation that it had on cultures who had to deal with depopulation and um, the kind of the eradication of their hierarchies, both in terms of the politics, but also their, their social and familiar hierarchies. Um, but, you know, one of the things certainly that, that Washington learned in his life was the ways in which his smallpox scars said something about him and offered him um, certain kind of protections in certain societies too. So, so there were visible markers that obviously meant something in, in those societies. But, but yeah, it's a great question. I'll think more about that in terms of how wider cultures maybe adapted to the issue of smallpox. Uh, Jeremy Anderson thanks you for your talk and asks if you have any more insight into how religion factored into dealing with these pandemics. Yeah, it's great to, Jeremy was a, a former student of mine. He wrote a fantastic senior thesis last year about um, the ways that hurricanes affected uh, tropical societies. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, as I kind of mentioned, there was a lot of confusion about how to treat these illnesses. And so religion was obviously critical for how indigenous societies um, tried to deal with it. And uh, in terms of smallpox, it was also really critical in, in the kind of mission efforts of Europeans. So we have a lot of sources from the French, particularly in Canada, and they are talking about sort of the experience of smallpox coming into those communities and the ways in which they were trying to leverage that experience of disease to try to convert more Native Americans by saying, um, if you convert to our God, he will offer you protections against this disease and this illness. And so it was sometimes used by a tool as a tool by, by certain religious figures to try to accelerate conversion as a method of protection. And in some cases, those indigenous societies would go along with that. Um, There's some evidence that uh, the Mexica or the Aztecs um, converted to Catholicism in an effort to try to stem the tide of destruction that um, smallpox and other diseases had on those populations. Um, and as I mentioned too, it, it, there was just a sort of uh, general appeal by all societies towards their religious figures um, in that period. Thank you. Um, we have one question come in talking about how history tends to repeat itself. Uh, what do you see repeating itself from, from what you've seen back in colonial days to today? And how do you think that'll impact us moving forward? Well, that's a great question. And, and one of the things that happens in the American Revolution is there's a bad uh, spread of, of smallpox in Boston in the winter of 1775. And so um, this is sort of right when the American Revolution is kind of kicking off. And there's sort of this blase attitude by a lot of people that, oh, it's not gonna affect me or I'm not gonna get it. Or if I kind of stay somewhat sheltered, I'll be okay. And there's really not a lot of, um, I would say, adherence to the need for quarantines in Boston uh, in 1775. And so because of that, Boston is really ravaged by smallpox going into um, the summer and the fall of 1776. And because of this, George Washington actually kind of pulls his troops away from Boston because he knows that if he has his troops anywhere near there, they're gonna get infected pretty aggressively with smallpox. And I think a lot of us have been reading a lot about the, the what happened, especially in California during the pandemic um, of 1918. And uh, the LA Times has had a lot of interesting articles about sort of the differences between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And it was kind of flipped from today where San Francisco was a little bit less um, uh, ahead of the curve in terms of their social distancing and their wearing of masks and their quarantining. And because of that, San Francisco was, was hit pretty hard by the 1918 uh, flu epidemic. And so um, I, I think that we, we kind of see this similar recurrence of people becoming a little bit callous to the needs for social distancing or for the kind of science behind what's going on. And with the sort of typical 
uh, uh, consequences, which is that infection tends to increase. People tend to be sort of uh, hit pretty, pretty hard by that. So um, I think we're all kind of noticing these parallels in history. And unfortunately, um, the science hasn't changed too dramatically about the, the spread of diseases um, over the last 15,000 years. And so. Last question comes from Rebecca Pollen. Uh, did the British, Spanish, and French empires issue any guidelines for their armies against malaria or, or other diseases? Anything similar to what we see now from our state and local governments? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, malaria was hard because it was, there was just a real lack of understanding about what was going on. There was a recognition that kind of um, drier climates were better places to be. Um, so in the case of the British and the Spanish, they tried when they could to bring their armies into higher elevation locations. So um, for the Spanish, they would try to go into the mountains if there was a particularly bad area, a bad outbreak of, of smallpox and malaria. Um, and for the British, they would try to do the same in the, in the mountains of the Caribbean. And that tended to have some impact and some improvement on the health of their, their soldiers. Again, they did it without really kind of just as a, a, a knowing what the causation, not knowing what the causation was, just really noticing that, well, they tended to do better in sort of higher and drier climates. So that was one of the appeals that was put forward for uh, militaries was to actually go to higher elevations when they could uh, in order to kind of um, try to stem the tide of, of that infection and malaria in particular. Great, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Professor Livesey, for your time. We do hope to see you at future events and activities. We'll be featuring some alumni next week uh, and hope to see you there. I'm gonna unmute everyone so you can say hello, say thanks to Professor Livesey. Uh, and so I'm gonna do that right now. Yes. That's all right, good. thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You want to have a great day. Happy Thank Memorial you. Day. <laughs> good to see you, Marshall Jarvis. Looking good. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like the goatee, John Tone. <laughs> oh, hey, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Oh, great. Have a good day, everyone. Oh, yes. Hello, Michael. Hi, Thank good you. day, also. Hi. Thank you. Adios. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everybody. All right.